Good morning. My name is Randa Noble, and I'm going to be reading the scripture for today, which is found in James 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when, tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. When I was in college, I played offensive line in football. And our halftime conversations with the offensive line coach was actually pretty simple. He would just yell and scream in our faces and say, hit the wall, keep hitting the wall. That was it. That was the motivation we got. Nothing fancy. Now, I played in the 90s. Now it's uh, more of a quarterback game with long throws, but... Back in the day when I played, they would give the ball to a very fast, skinny guy and have him line up behind a very thick, strong guy. I was not the fast, skinny guy. And would run up the middle over and over again. And you need 10 yards for a first down, so what was the goal on every play? Four yards. You got four yards three times in a row, guess what you got? You got a first down. And you just did that over and over and over again. And that was our beautiful strategy. So we'd come in at halftime, and we had a few three-yard or two-yard runs, and that tiniest little offensive line coach I ever played for would stand in front of five huge men like me, and would, wouldn't even, we'd be sitting, and he'd practically be looking us in the eye, that's how short he was. And he would just say, hit the wall, keep Hitting the wall, and that was the mentality. No matter what it was, every single play, you get in your stance, you fire off the ball, and you keep driving. You just keep driving. And I hear a little bit of that when I hear the language of James chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. And I just call it a little different language. Rather than hit the wall, it's stay the course. Stay the course. I can hear that lineman coach saying to me, stay the course. You will have conflict. There will be resistance. It will be hard. You will be tired. And you stay the course. So as Vera rightly said, James wants to speak into our lives on three things suffering, living wisely, and our money. And beautifully, last week as James introduced the topic of our finances, we celebrated Ascension Sunday that God is King over all things. And pastorally in His providence this week for us, as we deal again with the topic of suffering, we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, which reminds us that the Spirit of God is dwelling with us, empowering us, a down payment for our encouragement as we stay the course in, get this, a totally broken world where death feels like it's raining, where war seems unyielding, where brokenness and sadness overwhelm. You hear the Apostle say, stay the course. Stay the course. God is good. Stay the course. Let's pray and look at this text. Father, help us to hear from You this morning as we come, some may be joyfully, celebrating the common grace gifts of our Creator. And others, coming in brokenness. Recipients of the common curse, a broken, fallen world with broken bodies and broken relationships and broken systems and situations. Reaching for God the Redeemer. 
who explains to us here how His redemption works in and through our brokenness. So help us to hear, Father, and would you, by the very Spirit we celebrated coming today on Pentecost Sunday, would you, by the Spirit that directed the writing of these words, would you, by that Spirit, apply this message to our hearts? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a couple things. Remember, James is not afraid to get into your business. Right? right. Not supposed to talk about politics or religion. James, no holds barred. He'll talk about all those things at every family dinner. Right? Wisdom likes to get in your business and talk about what you might need to do. And in this second round of the conversation of suffering, there's a slightly different bend. If you were with us a few weeks ago when we looked at verses 2 to 4 in chapter 1, James described the benefits of trials. Like the, the kind of things that trials do. Like they're hard, I know, but God uses them to purge and to form and to shape us. Here, these verses describe the final result of our trials. And let me give you what I think is the summary of verse 12. That's the main verse. In fact, if you, if you want to hear my breakdown of this text, 12 to 15 in chapter 1. 12 is the main theme. It's the main message. If you want to memorize a verse, I don't know if you've done this before, but if you, if you memorize Scripture, this is a verse to memorize. I hope you have your Bibles open, by the way, and you're looking at the text with me, because I'm going to look at words and phrases and, and all of those things. But verse 12 is the main theme, and then verses 13 to 15 explain away some misunderstandings, right? So it's pretty clear. Like, this isn't hard. Verse 12 is hard to do. It's not hard to understand. And verse 13 to 15 makes sure that you avoid some pitfalls or some common errors that Christians are tempted to do. But let's start with the main theme in verse 12. Christians, stay the course. A God-trusting perseverance through your trials in this life will be greatly rewarded in the glorious new life to come. Those are my words, but I'm just translating the message of verse 12. Let's look at its details. And before, before I even get into the words of the text, I, I want to talk about its context. James is assuming you understand the world in which we live. L- l- let, me, let me set it for you in, in, in case the coffee hasn't fully set in yet. God created the world and He made it beautiful. It was full intention for it to be a dwelling place, a temple that we would dwell with Him forever. You and I, representatively through Adam and Eve, were not satisfied with what He made or even were where we were in the order. You ever deal with pride in your life? Selfishness, envy, welcome to the club. So we rebelled against our Creator. We thought we deserved some of the things and the pride of place that He had. And when that happened, there was a break between humanity and God, between creatures and Creator, and it had radical destructions. Every funeral you go to, every bad diagnosis, every broken relationship, the massive feelings of insecurity and shame that every one of us feel is literally symptoms of that result. That's why I call it the common curse. God made the world beautiful, common grace. But the fall brought in the common curse, and we all taste it. Now Jesus came by His grace, entered fully into creation, literally took our place, like the old wrestling matches. Tap in, and we tapped His arm, and He jumped into the ring, and He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, and He died a perfect death that we owed. And He accomplished what God had intended for the first Adam to do. He was the second Adam. And we, the gathered church, are descendants of the second Adam and have life eternal promised in Him. But not yet! Remember that good creation thing? It's not like we're immediately sucked off into some heavenly domain. God's intention for creation would come to fruition. Jesus wasn't plan B, He was plan A. 
And that means we're living in between those times. We're waiting for the renewal of all things. We're waiting for the end of funerals. We're waiting for the lack of need of a hospital. Imagine that day when you won't need a hospital. Pharmacies go out of business. Apologies to our pharmacists here. There's no longer a need for a doctor. Funeral homes are out of existence. Graveyards are now playgrounds. But not yet. We live in between the times where the common grace will finally and formally be established everywhere, but we still deal with a bit of the common curse. So how are we supposed to live now? Like, What's the trajectory? How do I live my life in light of that? Welcome to verse 12. Verse 12 is assuming all of that's taking place. That you and I know one day all things will be restored. We're waiting for the new creation. We're waiting to level Honquest Funeral Home and McCorkle and Rockton and, and have playgrounds. We're waiting for that day. We're waiting for hospitals to be gone. And bodies to be restored. That beautiful image of Bud Larson having a conversation, the late b- brother Bud Larson having a conversation with Ed Tithcombe, wondering about the strength of his legs returning. And Ed Tithcombe, our elder chair, saying, your legs will be strong. You'll run, brother. Not yet, but in the new creation. So until then, how does a Christian deal with the broken condition of our world? How do we think about it and live in it? Or how do we find purpose? Maybe that's the question. How do we find purpose in this brokenness? Well, here it is, verse 12. And it starts with the wisdom theme. Blessed. It starts with a beatitude. Remember Jesus' beatitudes in Matthew? Blessed are those who... A beatitude is a statement that describes how life goes well for Christians. This is the way of blessing. This is how you flourish in the midst of difficulties. Remember, blessing isn't just in good thing, in the good things. It is always and only in the God things. Because again, you and I have we can be we can be catechized by culture and our little hashtag blessed, right? Which Twitter mugs. T-shirts, signs in living rooms. What does it mean to you to be blessed? Is it only the common grace? Or can you be blessed in the midst of the common curse? James would say you can. It's not just in the good things, it's in the God things. And even our trials can be seen in the God things. So the promise is this, that there is blessing Verse 12, there is blessing to the one who perseveres under trial. There is blessing. But here's the task. You must persevere. There's that line coach saying, hit the wall. Hit it. It will come down. Hit the wall. Anything else for me, coach? Nope. Hit the wall. Blessed is the one who who perseveres under trial. Stay the course as you endure trials in the world. The suffering of the common curse. Remember why. James isn't just saying, I really don't care if you're hurting. That's not what he's saying. Remember what he said in verses 2-4. to Suffering is the common process by which God purges us of impure things. And purifies us for the purpose of strengthening us. Again, not to ch- God doesn't do that to challenge our faith, but to awaken our faith into fullness. That's what the word perseverance is referring to. Perseverance is not weak, passive submission to suffering and difficulty. Perseverance is a strong, active, challenging response in which the satisfying realities of Christianity are proven in practice. Blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Common grace. 
Blessed be your name. On the road marked with suffering, when there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Common curse. But what is found in both? Blessing. Not just in the good things, but in the God things. That is alien and stranger language to anybody in the world. That must be the language we speak in the church. That is not the story of the world that anybody in the world is going to want to believe or live out. That has to be the story. You have to make that the story that you and I live out. And what is that blessing? The person who endures in this life will receive in full the life to come. Let me just read the text. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. The crown, by the way, is not a royal crown. I, I, I'm horrible with pictures and graphs. But I put a picture in your notes for you this time. Don't ever expect it again. The crown is not a royal crown. That's probably what we think. Like, a, like royalty language. The crown is the laurel wreath given in the ancient world to the victorious athlete. 1 Corinthians 9.25 makes the same statement. It's a symbol of spiritual success given to the servants of the King who keep their faith in the midst of suffering and temptation. You did it! You stayed the course. And notice it's the crown of life in that the blessed reward is eternal life. The renewal of life. Which means the end of suffering and sin in the new creation. The award that you get is that funeral homes will be no more one day. The reward that you get is that divorce attorneys will be no more one day. The reward that you get is that hospitals and pharmacies are barren and empty one day. Stay the course. This is no prosperity blessing when, where, where bounty comes beyond what was lost. The Bible never offers get-rich schemes or promises the removal of sins, curses before the new creation. Did you hear that? The Bible never promises quick, rich, get-rich-quick schemes or promises the removal of sins, curses before the new creation. It actually doesn't at all. Anybody that tells you something is tell, selling you snake oil or some kind of thing like that. That, that, is, that is hogwash. God will overturn the evil in our world. He will take away sickness and death, war, abuse, poverty, loneliness, hate, violence, and every form of suffering. Even hangnails. But His only promise, hear this, His only promise is to do so in the new creation. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me say this to just be honest. The reward, these rewards are of such a kind that only a true Christian would ever even appreciate them. Like, if I'm going to go out on Main Street in Roscoe and try to sell this, people be like, that's not what I'm looking for. But the Christian puts their hope in God's promised Word, even if the promise includes the phrase, not yet. So James is saying this, if you want to receive what God is doing in and for you, Picture your trial right now. Probably not hard to do. Picture where you are embracing and embodying the suffering of our world. And in a room of this many people, I can imagine there's many examples. 
If you want to receive what God is doing in and for you, endure your trial to its end. Embrace it in a way that trusts that the God who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is where a modern day preacher named Olstein has it completely wrong in his well-known book, Your Best Life Now. Because if Jesus were to write that book, He would entitle entitle it, Your Best Life to Come! But not yet. Not yet. Romans 8.18 I, this is Paul, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Did you hear that? It's not even a comparison. It's not even a comparison. Seriously? Because this feels pretty bad. Then imagine how that will feel really good. Or how about... Jesus' words to the church in Smyrna in Revelation 2.10, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Doesn't that sound exactly like what James just said in verse 12? So you're like, hey, Pastor Mickey, great, yeah, like it. How in the world do I do this? Fair question. Let me give you a couple thoughts on how to apply verse 12. First of all, memorize the verse. Say it over and over again. Because in the middle of those games, with that football team, I would look over and see Coach Howard, that tiny little offensive lineman coach that any one of us could have just stepped on and that would have been it. And I'd see him just going like this with his arm and I knew exactly what he was saying. He'd point at me, he'd point at Marlon, and he's going like this, and he's like, Hit the wall. Stay the course. Stay it. He didn't need to say anything else. I needed to focus and drive as hard as I could. Stay the course. I couldn't worry about what the running back was doing or the quarterback or the receivers. I had to do one thing. Stay the course. Or maybe just to start memorize that verse. And in the morning or in the evening, on the road marked with suffering... When there's pain in the offering, the words of this verse should run between your ears. Be the tune your heart whimpers. Another would be we have to see the full story of the Bible. We we, we have to. That is so hard for us to do because we live in a truncated version of the true story. To be honest with you, even when you think of a person's life, you think of from birth to death. That's not the way the biblical story has it. I wonder if even our tombstones are telling the wrong story. For the Christian, does their life end the moment their heart stops? No. Now you know that in word. You'd pass the theology test with a good A or A minus. But do you know that indeed? Like, do you really believe that a funeral is not the end? Do you really believe that? Is that the story you're living? Or are you and I no different than our neighbors who truncated even more? We we think in terms of retirement. Or the weekend. T-G-I-F. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for the new creation. 
if Friday, maybe once a year on Good Friday, but I hardly think that warrants a restaurant. Again, what version of the story are you living in? You might just need to change the story that you're living out. This is not it. God offers the full version of the story. The one in which He is involved and which He guarantees. Remember verse 12 that you're going to memorize soon? Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Do you love Him? And that's promised to you. It's a version of delayed gratification. James 12 is telling you not your best life now, your best life to come. And you and I need to delay gratification. Hard to do. Oh, hard to do. Hard. When you just are broken and you feel lost because you have emotions and you're human and you're living in the common curse, but you're hoping in the fullness of resurrection, hard to do. But you must stay the course. Walk. Grasp on the Jesus. Right? We, we, we do this in other ways as a Christian. We rightly say that physical intimacy, to use an example, is reserved for the marriage covenant. And so the faithful men and women, young men and women, before they are married, will do what? While their body works just fine, and better then than maybe later, they delay gratification until they enter into their covenant with their husband or with their wife. Knowing that that is reserved for a specific time and a specific place. Even though they could have their best life now. They wait. They trust. They stay the course. They put it in proper perspective. They delay gratification and they wait for the right time. Well, that's hard to do. With physical pleasure, to give just one example. Now try to do that with your loved one. To say goodbye earlier than you'd want. To see the brokenness of the world that will not be repaired. Yet. And you delay gratification. You trust in God's covenantal purposes. And you wait for the new resurrection. Hard to do. Lord, help us. Let me end with just a couple mistakes that verses 13 to 15 describe. There are two mistakes that Christians should avoid when they face suffering trials. Now, I do want to warn you in these verses, I, the word temptation, when we see trial in verse 12, we immediately think external. When we in English hear the word temptation, we think internal. Here's the thing. In Greek, in this passage, that's all the same word. And it can be used externally, something you're a passive recipient of suffering, but it also can be used internally where that external trial begins to morph and control you. So it's kind of powerful how easily what happens to us on the outside changes how we function on the inside. But just be aware that that Greek word that represented with a couple different English words, is actually not changing at all. Verse 13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Notice there's the first, there's the first rebuke. Don't blame God. Some blame God for their suffering trial. That is not fair. James is summarizing the message of Scripture in verse 13. The Old Testament makes clear that God did not test people in this sense of putting his people into situations where their willingness to obey was tested. Now, when Satan tested Jesus, he was totally evil intentions. When God tested Abraham, it was to strengthen his faith. It was to prove his faith. There's that purging idea, verses 2 and 4 in James 1. It was refining his faith. It wasn't to get him. 
It was to grace him. So when tempted, verse 13, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. Quite simply, God does not play with evil, nor does He do evil to others. Now now hear that, because a very common response when difficult things happen is that you and I get mad at God. And to put it frankly, you better watch it. You watch yourself. Don't you dare go there. You're going to feel that, but when you do, you're putting your place at the constant and God is the variable. Don't go there. God is the constant. He is a good, good Father. Unchanging and perfect. He doesn't play with evil. You and I are the ones that decided to tweak a bit His good creation. And we're living with the symptoms of that. Don't you dare blame God. The second mistake is in verses 14 and 15. I summarize it this way. Some allow their suffering trial to give them an excuse for sin. Look at at 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire enticed. And look at verse 15 is like a gestation process. After desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Notice what verses 14 and 15 are saying. If someone is to blame, it is not God, but the person who improperly perseveres in their suffering, or fails to persevere, who fails to stay the course. James' use of the word desire teaches us that we will be tempted to have our suffering define us. Or we will be tempted to have our suffering direct how we live in a way that counters God's promise. Don't do that. Remember the end of verse 13? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. Interestingly, if the beginning of our passage today, verse 12, says that perseverance has an end result of life, the end of our passage says that sin has an end result of death. The wisdom's two ways. Blessed is the one who pursues life. Cursed is the one who chases after death. All right, so... Pastor, how do I actually apply this to my life? Let me give you three H's. Vera gave that away. She's cruel. Three H's. When a suffering trial comes, the Christian might be advised to take three steps. The first H is ask for help. Ask the Lord for help. Lord, help me, you might pray, to see the full story, to believe it. And beautifully on Pentecost Sunday, this would be our prayer. May the Spirit comfort me. May the Spirit guide me. May the Spirit protect my heart. May the Spirit counsel me in wisdom. Ask the Lord for help. Read the Psalms. What are they doing? In the midst of suffering, they're praying to the Lord for help and mercy. Ask the Lord for help. Second, get into a huddle. The church, the body of Christ is an essential component of the Christian faith. You cannot do life well, if at all, without the body of Christ. You were designed to be in family with them. You are children of the Father. That's a plural. The Bible loves to say children, plural. You, plural. Get into a huddle. A strange football analogy I started with, when we were in the huddles as offensive linemen, we were literally holding hands. You ever held hands with a couple 300 pound men? I would never do it in any other circumstance. But as I sat between Kevin and Travis, as I was a left guard and Travis was a left tackle and Kevin was the center, 
and you had a good 1,500, maybe 1,600 pounds lined up there in that huddle, and that skinny little coach yelling, hit the wall, we're all holding hands. But a couple months ago, short after my diagnosis from Laura, the right guard, Marlon, who I hadn't seen in quite some time, showed up at church on a Sunday. I saw him in the back, big, scary-looking guy, just a little older. And he walked down that aisle right there, and he reached his arms around me. I'd held his hands thousands of times. And he whispered in my ear, I'm always your teammate. That's the church. It's beautiful. Get in the huddle. Last, and this is, the, this is the trick, live today in the fact of Christian hope. Live today in the fact of Christian hope. Hebrews 11, right? We love this verse as a plaque. Don't make it a plaque. Don't make it a t-shirt. Make it oxygen. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for. An assurance about what we do not see. Oh, that's beautiful. Because right now, all I see is hospitals and funeral homes. Not for long. This, I love verse 2. There, here's this extension of the holy huddle of the church of Christ. This is what the ancients were commended for. Let's pray. Father, You are such a good God. And we have so truncated Your story to our best life now. We, we, we make You a, a marketing tactic. An app. Something convenient for our life. And if You don't give it to us like a bad butler or a poor therapist, we're just mad at You. How foolish are we resembling our fallen parents of, of old. Lord, help us live with hopeful assurance of what we do not yet see like our brothers and sisters of the past. Help us, like our brother Bud Larson, to long for strong legs. Help us, like our brother Jim Craig, to long for a body without pain. Help us in this very filled room to long for a body without broken marriages, and depression and anxiety, and broken systems, and hurting people, and sadness and tears, wars and poverty and hate and violence. Lord, help us to see that our life isn't defined by the numbers on a tombstone, but by an empty tomb out of which You walked. Help us to live that story. Father, we cannot do it without Your Spirit. We cannot will it. We cannot stay the course, even by Your command in verse 12, without the power of Your Spirit. So we pray beautifully on Pentecost Sunday, to fill us with Your Spirit, to live Your story, to hope in You. And as I prayed at the beginning, Father, that You would apply this to each of my brothers and sisters, to each of Your beloved children in the exact way that only You can. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.